Okay. You got it? We're, okay, we're live. Okay, awesome. We're going to start one minute, everybody, whoever's on. Okay, one minute. Okay, you got, you got, Max, have you got it? Just check who's on. Check who's on it. See who's on it. Just check who's on it. Check who's on it. I'm trying to check it out who's on it. I'm sure. you can. Okay, let's go set that. <laughs> Yeah, buddy. There is this like delay, so I'm still experiencing delay, it seems. But I think if you start, there's not much more you can do. Okay, it's fine. If there's a slight delay, it is what it is, I guess. Yeah? Okay. Public service announcement just before we start the actual shear and so on. Anybody didn't Davin Marav yet? Anybody not Davin Marav? Okay, great. So we'll Davin Marav right after. It's perfect. perfect. We should have a minion, the Revach. Uh, wonderful. Okay, first of all, postkin before Hachsanya. Whenever I speak, I always want to, to thank the host. And the host tonight, as it is almost for most of my shiurim, is the Kihilat Eretz Chemda. You see, we're in a base medrash. We, it's really during the week, it's a base medrash that is a kolel. On Shabbos, this uh, environment is transformed from a place of basically pure Torah to really incredible, inspirational tefillah, also with, uh, also with Torah. And over the past uh, past year and a half, for Shusra Pinchas, over the past year and a half, I've been blessed to give dozens and dozens of uh, shiurim here in the shul in honor of and in memory of my father. I'll show you this a little bit later. I was zochet to put together a book of the shiurim that uh, I gave. Many of the sources, some of them are, are the shiurim are written up, some are not fully written up, but it's uh, it's a very special. It's very special. We'll come back to that bezrat Hashem uh, later later in the night. The shul is very, very special. It's uh, really an incredible place that, that both promotes and then pursues Torah, Avodah, and Chesed in ways that, frankly, I don't know if anybody's ever seen before. It's, it's actually incredible. It's intense. It's creative. Wherever there is a need, that's basically what we that's basically what we pursue. And we're very, very, we're very blessed. We really are blessed. Ashrenu and Zachinu to be part of a, a shul like this. And my father would have been very proud. I'll tell you, I, I, I don't say it lightly. I'm not saying it's Tom because, okay, I'm speaking. I'm speaking about my father. My father would have had such uh, such incredible, incredible nachas just to see what the shul is doing and to see the shiurim that I can give in the shul and all the different things that we're doing in the shul. It's really it's really something. So first of all, thank you very much for hosting the, the share tonight and for hosting it digitally for the people that are on the live stream as well. And I want to especially give a special thanks to Max, who's in the is in the back. He's grabbing some uh, vegetarian sushi, but this would not be happening on the live without Max. That's where I was. I was upstairs uh, for a while. So thank you. Uh, really, most importantly, I really just want to acknowledge the presence of my mother. She should live and be well. Bezrat Hashem. I want to thank her for sponsoring the obscene amount of sushi that we have in the back. <laughs> so Chevra, please, like, like I mean, we like we like sushi, but you know, take it home with you. Oh, because my father would have, and, 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 he'd be, and he'd be eating some of the obscene amount of sushi, just, you know, as my father, Baruch Hashem, enjoyed. He was not, he was a very healthy and fit person, but he enjoyed his, his food, Kanan Nahara and sushi in particular. So you'll have part of that, uh, the Nachas Ruach, not just the Torah, but also also enjoying the, uh, the sushi. So thank you, Mom, and thank you for coming. It's a tremendous privilege for me to, to be here. I've been thinking about this shir for a long time, and, uh, and I hope that together we're going to grow not just from the, the learning, but I hope I hope to do tonight is to enhance our Sadaram. That's really the goal. The goal tonight is really to enhance our Seder. In order, in order to have a, a, a really special spiritual experience that demands preparation, Kedusha demands Hachana. In order to have a depth, a depth of, a, of an experience, we have to have a depth of reflection and a depth of an analysis. And, and, and if we wait till the Seder night, it's too late. And so what I want to try to do tonight is to help us move past, perhaps, sometimes we get stuck a little bit in our religious development. Sometimes we get stuck, the last class I took when I was in elementary school. Sometimes it's the last class that I took when I was in high school. Sometimes it's the last class I took when I was in yeshiva. But as adults, we would never tackle any other important or meaningful topic in any way. So I'm just going to put on my recorder. I apologize for that. I realized I wasn't recording. We would, we would, never, we would never approach anything meaningful to us the same way that we approached it when we were 12 years old, 17 years old, certainly not when we're in our 40s, 50s, maybe there might even be people in the crowd who are in the 60s or 70s, possible. But if you are, it's so important every year, right, every year to look at it, look at it, tackle it, understand it. And that curiosity, 
to understand what we're doing, just to ask the questions. Why do we do this? It's, it's something that I try to, to, to reiterate over and over in the shurim that I give in general, but it's something that will enhance, literally it can change your entire Seder. And it's an incredible thing because it opens our eyes. And we do things in different ways. Tonight what I want to do is I want to show you that if you look at details, structurally, we just pick a random potpourri of details and we use that to develop a theme. Then what we can do is then hopefully work backwards from the theme and show how that theme then reflects on so many other details. And there's a reciprocal relationship between the details and the themes. And it's very, very powerful and hopefully will enhance our Seder in that way. A second goal that I have tonight is, as the title alludes, is to have some reflections on Kaddish. Kaddish is a, uh, it's, it's an interesting experience. It's a powerful experience. And frankly, I don't know, those people in the, in the audience who have uh, the privilege, however you'll call it, the opportunity to say, to say Kaddish, it's, uh, it's really demanding. It's demanding, and, and, but it's also an opportunity. And it is an opportunity to reflect. I think I said Kaddish over the course of the year, uh, including the times when I was about tefillah, over 3,000 Kaddishim. There are about four or five different Kaddishim that we have that we say. But of the four primary types that we say, I said about over 3,000 Kaddishim. I'm trying to do the math, try to figure out exactly. It's not possible to get the exact number. But over 3,000 Kaddishim over the course of 11 months. That's a lot of opportunity to think about Kaddish. But uniquely, what I want to share tonight is not just about the Kaddish, but also how the Kaddish reflects on my father. And you learn, hopefully, throughout the night about my father, which is really a big piece of what I want to share with you, with my family, much of which is uh, in front of us here, but also they're joining us from America as well. And then I want to share with you unique facets of my father, tie that into the theme of the Seder and tie it into the theme of the Kaddish, but hopefully growing together through that realization. And that learning and that enhancement of our Seder and hopefully the enhancement of us as people should accrue to his benefit at Shabisha and Aliyah for his uh, for his Nisham and Mitzvah. Okay. So let's just start with some basic questions. By show of hands, who here wears a kittel on, at their Seder? So I'll say, but I, I don't. I don't. Why do we wear a kittel? Why do we wear a kittel? Because your father did. Oh, that's it. My father didn't. My father didn't. My father was a Baal Shuvah, so his father didn't. But your father did. So you, you do. And your boys do. And that's it. Okay. We don't. My son doesn't. Why, why do you wear a kittel? Anybody? What's the, what's the reason? Why do we? What? As what, what is, it's, just, it's just a nice, it's a kacha. Okay, it's a nice, it's a nice, it's like wearing a, uh, a, a fancy silk, whatever kacha. That's it. It's, it's, it's a way of dress. That's all. Very good. Okay. What else? Yeah. Oh, special meal. We're going to come back to that in a minute. What else? Some people, you know, people, some people say, yeah. I don't wear one, but it's encouraged the children. No, that's it. That's the answer. That's it. We can do whatever we want. We can. Ever, I wear. I wear. I don't wear a kittel. I wear a ridiculous hat sometimes at the seder. And then my kids say, "Why are you asking? Why are you wearing a hat?" That's why. That's why I'm wearing the hat. That's it. We say, but 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 it's important to understand that those of you who do wear a kittel, they say, "Why do we wear a kittel? Why do why do you might have husbands, fathers who have worn kittels? Why do we wear a kittel? Why don't we wear a kittel?" But really, we're going to ask why we do wear a kittel. Very simple question. Number two, second important question, very basic. We'll make our way through the stairs just a little bit. You'll see what we're going to do. We're going to do this for the entire night to understand things that we do, what we say and what we do. Who here washes their hands for orchats in their family? Some people have different families. So in their family, who here has only the father washes the hands? Okay. Okay. Who here has only the men? My, my, my mother and my wife here, that'll be very, it's, it's a little bit, it might be a little bit offensive. But who only the men? Don't worry, you can raise your hand. Who here, everybody, everybody washes their hands. We do, right? We all wash our hands. Why do we wash our hands? What's the reason? Why do we wash our hands? Dipping. Dipping. Do, you, do you wash your hands the rest of the year when we dip? Oh, whoa, we should. Ah, oh, there we go. So now, what's the next question? That's the thing. That. What's the next question? Why don't we? That, 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 that should bother us. Meaning, meaning you put yourself on the spot. I don't mean to pick on you, but, you for a sec. but, but that's the question, right? I, I, I give, I've given a shear on this, on Tibuli, Bamashka, these types of things in, in, in the past. And I've encountered one person, literally one student of mine, a young lady in California 20 years ago, who told me that her family eats, they, they eat wet fruit with the fork. They eat pickles with forks because they don't want to touch the fruit. As the only person I've ever met who's mocked in our world in some form, given from the hundreds of students, that's ever said that they don't eat, uh, that they wash their hands before they, before they eat wet food. So the, the halacha really is, you can see this in source number one, the halacha is that if you have, if we eat food that was dipped in one of seven liquids, meaning wine, 
honey, oil, milk, dew, blood, or water. Velonis nagev, and it's not dried off. I feel mamashka, even though you don't actually touch the wet part of the fruit or vegetable, you have to actually wash your hands without a bracha. And so the question becomes, why suddenly on Pesach night do we do this? And why don't we do it any other night? But it should bother us, right? Meaning, if, if we're consistent, then we're consistent. Either don't do it or do do it. And is it so odd that even more than that, the, 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 there are a couple, a couple of people in the crowd who only the men do it, only the fathers do it, the children don't do it. It's a very strange halacha. Now let me ask you one more lumdisha question. Okay, and then we're going to, you'll see, we're going we're gonna to get the juices flowing a little bit, and we're going to tie this all into our Seder. It's going to become very, very relevant. There is a very interesting halacha. I'm going to say it outside for the sake of time, that we're not allowed to stop between, once we wash our hands, we're not allowed to stop the talk until we're done with korech, until we eat the sandwich, the smsfardim in the crowd. Do you use soft matzah? Isaac? No, some people use soft matzah. That's really korech. Korech really is a wrap. It's like a lafa a little bit. So, but we, the Ashkenazim, where we have, you know, the, the cardboard, we have, so it's a little bit hard to, can't really wrap it, but, but that's, what, that's really what it should be. It should be korech, like we're korech, you, you wrap it. But we're not allowed to talk. We're not, the halacha is very clear in the Shulchan Aruch that we're not allowed to talk from the time we wash until Sadaim until we're done eating korech. But the problem is that the Shulchan Aruch explicitly, after it says that, it tells us the following halacha, the end of source number four, it says, after before you eat korech, what do you have to do? You have to say the words and you have to eat the korech. But, but, but when you, you, shouldn't, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't you shouldn't talk. So which one is it? Are you not allowed to talk? Or, or the Shulchan Aruch says you're supposed to talk. He says you're supposed to say zechel lemektash kehillel. Or is it you're not allowed to lo yasiach daito? Me'yana suda. Oh, so you want to say this is me'yana suda. Okay. So you say this is me'yana suda. Is it really? So what's to, so so that's that's the question, right? Is, is it considered me'yana me, suda? I mean, if I say to you, pass the pass the matzah, that's me'yana suda. If I say I want to wash my hands, it's past it. No, no, this is not my question. This is not my question. This, if it's Alex Mondo's question, it'll be a little bit of a klutz kash. But I want to share with you what the Ver Halacha. The Ver Halacha was written by the author of the Mishnah Bura, Rabbi Yisrael Merah Cohen Kagan, and he writes in source number five. This bothers him tremendously, and he says it can't be. You can't have it both ways. He thinks this question is so serious that you have to read what he writes. I mean, he's, this question, the idea of talking, of even saying this is Zechul and Mikdash Gehillah, that I'm going to commemorate the destruction, the, the, the hill of the, the Mikdash as it was, the way that Hillel used to eat his sandwich. He thinks it's such a big problem. Look at the last line of source number five. He says, Vibule de Mistafina, were I not afraid? He's like, that's something radical. It really is radical. Hava mina de Tzarchlomer b'machaber, I would change the text in the Shulchan Aruch. He says, I would, I would edit the text and I would say, You dip it in the haroset, he takes out the words, the Omer. He says, I would dip it and you don't say anything. That's how serious he takes the question. How could it be that you talk? We can't talk, even though it sounds like it might be a little bit like the Suda, but it's not really. It's not past the food, it's not past the salt, it's not past the bread. So it's an incredible thing. So we have three basic, simple questions we start. Very simple. One is, why do we wear a kittel? Number two is, why do we wash our hands? Even if we're supposed to either do it all or nothing, do it all year or not. And the third is, what's the story here with the, with the hefsik? Why do we stop and we say, So I want to share with you tonight an approach, an insight that really is developed from my, from my Rebbe, Rav Meir Tversky, really straight through, uh, that will, I think, change how we view the entire the entire seder. Can I have a copy of the Makoros here? So I want you to go to the back, the back page. And this insight will help us, and you'll see, I'm giving a few examples. This one insight, this one theme from these few details will transform how we understand what the entire point of the seder is. It's an unbelievable thing. And you'll see... And when I point out this idea to you, as you go through the Seder, you're going to understand the Seder totally differently. And not only that, you're going to see so many other examples that you, that you probably never even thought of, never noticed in the Seder itself. Maybe you did. You'll put it under the setting. So then, this is written by the Nitziv. The Nitziv is a Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. He was the Rosh Yeshiva of Elijah of the 19th century. Velazhin was the premier Yeshiva in the world in the 19th century. And the Nitziv was the Rosh Yeshiva. He wrote a Haggadah called the Haggadah of Imre Shefer. And in the introduction to the Haggadah, he tells us one simple principle. And it's the first line 
that we have here, where, where the first arrow is. He says, Hachanas HaSeder Shal Pesach, Hinhigu Chazal, Chazal organized and designed the Seder of Pesach, Kemosha Hayu No Hagin Be'eret Yisrael B'zman Achilas Pesach. That the Seder night mimics, it functions the way it would have been had we actually lived in the time of when there was a base of Mikdash and we're bringing a Korban Pesach. And it's an incredible thing. And he goes to the next arrow and he explains. He says, That's why only on the Seder night do we wash our hands when we dip the fruit into the water or the, whatever we have, the bananas, the potatoes, the parsley, whatever we use. He quotes something else. Next line. And that's the same reason why we wear a kittel. Why? Some people thought that we should, shouldn't, uh, this, we should be reminded of our day of death because the person is buried in a kittel. And therefore, that should, he says, that's shocking. What does that do with anything? The reason why, says the Nitziv, the reason why we wear a kittel is because we're sitting like we're eating the Korban Pesach. We're sitting like royalty, like Malchus about to engage in eating the Korban Pesach, and that's what they wore. And he goes on to describe it in beautiful, beautiful detail. The halacha is that the reason why we wash our hands without a bracha is because there's one opinion that says that the only time that we really do wash our hands for food that's dipped in a liquid is in the time of the Mikdash. If you look in source number in source number two, the Mishnabur writes explicitly that the, the minhag of washing our hands for dipping something in a liquid was only when the laws of Tara, ritual purity, were enacted. So what we're doing is, what we're trying to accomplish the night of the Seder, says the Nitziv, is to reenact what it would have been like, just a touch. What it would have been like had we had a base of mikdash, and had we been sitting to eat the Korban Pesach with a kittel, we wash our hands like that betahara. And that is what Rav Tversky, upon whom many of the ideas here in the Shir are based, Rav Tversky, Rav Mir Tversky, Mir Rebbe, said, that's, that's how we understand the Shulchan Aruch. When we say Zecher Lamikdash Gehillo, it is part of the Suda, but not part of the Suda in the classic way. It's part of the Suda because, says Rav Tversky, it defines the fundamental nature of what we're trying to accomplish the night of the Seder. We're trying. This is not just something extraneous. It's a minha. We take korech, we wrap it, whatever we do with the with the maror, or a little bit, of, we dip it into the charos. Said no. When we say zechol mikdash kehillel, what we're trying to do is to elicit a sense of wow, we're here. We're commemorating what it will be like, what it will be like, what it was in the time of the Beis Hamikdash, because the Beis Hamikdash becomes that central focal point. And you'll see many, many examples of this throughout. The entire Haggadah. And so where it exists in terms of Minhag, in terms of the Kittel, in terms of perhaps Halacha, in terms of Karpas, in terms of the Halacha, of terms of Zechel and Mikdash, what we're trying to do, to some extent, is to reenact what it was like to actually live in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. But it's more than that. The theme of the Mikdash appears over and over again in the Seder. Look in source number source number six, just as an example, where we say thanks, the Allah has come of a kama, what we say after Dayenu, it's in Dayenu as well, you would think that if you want to give thanks on Seder night, where would the thanks end? I would think it should end by Yitzhak Mitzrayim, maybe by the crossing of the Yamsuf. But if you'll notice over and over again, where does it always end, almost always? By building the Beis HaMikdash. Hechnisanu l'Eret Yisrael, very end of verse number six. Uvan alano Beis HaBechir l'Chaper al-Khalon of Lamasim. Unbelievable. Again, the Beis HaMikdash. The Gra in his Haggadah says, that when we say at the very end of Magid, he says the highest point, each one corresponds to a step of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the highest point is the building of the Beis HaMikdash. Over and over again, the theme of the Beis HaMikdash appears in the context of the Haggadah. We're trying to relive, to commemorate, to celebrate what was. And you'll find many, many more examples. But that's only one, one portion of the Zechel Mikdash. Rabbi Salavechik, Zechron of Avracha, has a beautiful analysis where he notes that there are two categories of Zechel Mikdash. There's this type of Zechel Mikdash, 
where we commemorate and celebrate what was. But there's a second type of Zecher Lamikdash that mourns and laments what isn't. And it's an unbelievable thing that you find you, you find in the in the Haggadah. As an example, the Shulchan Aruch writes in source number some, source number eight, the second underlined section, before the underlined section, he says that we're not supposed to uh, eat any type of any type of roasted uh, types of meats because we might be confused with eating the korban pesach. And the Rama, who is the commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, he writes, "No, again for us Ashkenazim." We eat eggs. Does, does fire me any any type of any eggs, any lentils, nothing like nothing like that? They they eat they eat we eat eggs. You eat, you eat eggs. So my, so my father, my, my father, my father's a chron of bracha. When I was a kid, it was it was like it's like you know you're waiting hours and hours, you know, like like after magid, whatever it is, and then you had to wait for like the egg water. You know, is, who here has egg water? Anybody egg water? Okay, egg water, for those who don't know, is kishmo kenu. It's eggs and water. And if you're lucky, salt and salt. If you're lucky, you're lucky salt, that's it. Soda, you have soda water, I have like hot water, whatever it is. It's literally eggs and water. And, and as a kid, I would be like, who wants? <laughs> like, so then you start to learn, you say, well, it's a Ramah. In, gen in general, I'll try to teach you about my father. I go, my father's about Shuvah. And so I was just telling Hanani, I said, Hanani just returns from Krakow, you're diving in the Shul, the, the, the Ramah Shul in Krakow, which is this past Shabbos. And many of them hugging in my family because my father was about Chuva. He learned straight out of the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah. He knew his, he knew his from Poland, he knew his from Lodge. And so we'd be assumed many of them hugging with the Ramah it's automatically because the Ramah was what he learned. And so this is the Rabbah says that, they, that, that many people in, in Ashkenaz, some people in Ashkenaz, would eat, would drink and eat egg water. So we did it. But watch what the Ramah writes. And tell me what bothers you about this. Zecher la'avelus. Okay? Zecher la'avelus. Just before you finish the rest of the Ramah. It's yantif. It's yantif. If somebody is is in avelus before yantif, yantif gets rid of avelus. There is no avelus on yantif. Yantif, they, they, they can't coexist. My shloshim ended because my shloshim ended because it came up against yantif. So what does that mean? Avelus? You're sitting at the Seder table. Like the Jewish, you know, Independence Day. Right? July 4th, Lahavdil. And then suddenly we have an egg out of mourning. Now watch what the Ramah writes. The Nira Liata Mishum Shalel Tishaba Nikaba Balel Pesach. Because we'll show you in a moment, the same night of the week that Pesach falls out, Tishaba will always fall out. We don't have a Korban Pesach. So now we're, it's, it's the Korban based on Mikdash. Now we're, this is Tishaba. We're celebrating Tishaba on Pesach. Now, in case you don't believe me, we're really. We're really, um, really celebrating Tishbev on Pesach. Look at the next halacha, source number nine. It's from Michal's Tishbev. The Shulchan Aruch writes that that Sfaradim have the minhag lechol adashim and beitzim of Shalom Besochem on the Sudam of Sekes before the the meal before Tishbev. In source number nine, so they would eat again round food. They would eat lentils. But the Ramah writes, what does he write? Is that bother anybody? We eat egg and water. Egg and water. Egg and water. We eat mourners' food at the seder. I mean, it's like people make a bad Jewish joke, but it's like a really interesting thing. You know, it's like a crazy thing. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean that Tisha always falls out? There's a beautiful, the, the Shulchan Aruch writes, I'll do it outside not for the sake of time. Shulchan Aruch writes, you can see it inside in source number 10, that when we establish the calendar, there's certain rules that we have to establish the calendar. They're very helpful. So we have to call it an Atbash. An Atbash means that Aleph matches Tuf, Bet matches Shin. You go, you go from, you go basically a chiastic structure from the extremes of the alphabet until you get to the middle, closer and closer. So Aleph, it's all based on Aleph Bet Gimel Dalet Hey Vav Zayin is the days of Pesach, and you'll see we go backwards. That is the the days of the the holidays. So Aleph, the first night of Pesach, is tough Tisha B'av. So this year, Tisha B'av is, uh, Pesach is, gonna, is a Monday night. Tisha B'av is going to be on a Monday night. You go Bet Bet is the second day of Pesach. Shin is first to us. Just for to give us a little bit of chizuk, especially we I want to finish the the Atbash. I'll tell you something very beautiful. So Gimel. The third day of Pesach comes up with uh, Reish is going to be Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah you know, this year will be on a Monday, Tuesday, on a Wednesday, on a Wednesday night. And Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalid. So you have Dalid, and you go back Tuf, Shin, Reish, Kuf. So that's Kriyas Torah. That's going to be Simcha Torah. Then, the, then you go to you go to Hay, and Hay goes back to to Tzadi. So it's Som. So it's going to be the same day as Yom Kippur. And then Hay goes to Pay. It's a little bit backwards, but the fifth day of Pesach is the way Purim was. 
uh, Vav, excuse me, the Vav, 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 Vav of Pesach is going to be Purim from the past Purim that, that, that just passed. And we stop. And how many days are there in Pesach? How many days are there in Pesach? Seven. So here's something beautiful. Oh, there we go. So I heard years and years ago for the Tzionim, I'm one of them, in the crowd, that Zion goes to Ayin. The seventh day of Pesach is always the same day as Yom Ha'atzmoot, the same day as the Ayin. So people use that. So hey, Yar, hey, Yar will fall out on the same day, the seventh day of Pesach, which will be on a on a Monday. So Monday, so hey, so hey, Yar will be on a, a Monday. It works out. Yes, it actually, it actually works out. So obviously, in, in the Shulchan Aruch writing in the 1500s was not talking about the Yom Asmur in 1948, but uh, the Yamei Anu, especially Tavach Chizuk, we should be the Chag Hagula, we should, we should be able to celebrate Yom Asmur in its fullest form, uh, even with Mixas on, on on Zion. So we should, we should know that, that, that that's how it falls out. But again, you see the theme. It's a crazy thing that calendarically there's a theme built in. It's not just that there is a calendar coincidence that it happens to be the first night of Pesach falls out on Tisha B'av. The same night as Tisha B'av. But we, we commemorate it. That's an incredible thing. What are we commemorating? Could you believe it? On, on the actual night of Pesach, we're mourning. It's very it's a struggle to understand. Now I'll tell you the last one. The last one, I think, is, is fascinating. And for the Chavar here who might have heard some of this Torah before, this, I think, is actually really powerful and really beautiful. The, the Gemara tells us, the Mishnah tells us, that we have to structure the story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim in a very special way. We have to have, we have to start with Gnut and Messiah Bishvach. We start with the bad, whether it's the Avodah Zarah that we worship, whether it's the physical oppression, and we end with the positive. And then there's a very, very unique phrase. If you look in source number 11, tell us exactly how to do it. Source number 11, we'll, we'll start right before the bolded section. Matchil benuk Gnut and Messiah Bishvach. And the Gemara, and, and, and it tells us exactly where we have to, to read. What pasuk can we base it on? May Arami Ovevi, the story of an Ar- wandering Aramean was my father. That comes from the, the story of bringing the first fruit to Bikurim in Parshas Kisavo. Ad Shayigmar Kola Parsha Kula. Until we finish the entire Parsha. Now, in, when we say a Parsha in the Torah, we don't mean like a Parsha, like Kriya Satora. We don't mean a Parsha. We mean we need a section. Like in Microsoft language, we would call it a, a paragraph break or a page break. As we really want to finish, I even brought a, I brought a, uh, I brought a, a, a tikkun, but I, I didn't open up. I don't waste time showing to you. You can see visually where we're supposed to end. So if you look at the psukim, in source number twelve, this is what we should have. Source number twelve is the, the introduction, and then it starts. It tells you the story about a guy who brings his fruit to the kohen. In source in pasuk gimel of Asala kohen, he comes to the kohen, but lakacha kohen pasuk dalit. He, he's telling the story, right? He brings the the basket of fruit to the kohen. The Anisa of the Amarta. And this is what he has to say, and this is what we're supposed to say. Aramio Vyaravia, a wandering Aramean was my father. Machlokas Mimparshim, exactly what that Pasuk means. But that's this is where our Haggadah starts. This is where the narrative, the, the, the analysis in our Magad section of Haggadah, this is where it starts. And it goes and goes and goes and goes. And in every Haggadah I've ever seen, it ends by Pasuk Chet. That's what we have and we have the Makos, all those, all those different things. But that's not where the Parsha ends. If you look in the Torah, there's one more really important Pasuk that the that the farmer, when he brings the fruit to the Kohen, he says, and God brought us here to the base of Mikdash. He gave us this land. And then the story continues. Now I brought you the first fruits and so on and so forth. What happened to that last pasuk? Why, why do we stop? The Mishnah said that we're supposed to finish the entire section of everything basically, almost in quotes, that the farmer says to the Kohen. But we don't. We stop one pasuk short. Our entire magid is structured on this formulation, but we stop. So listen to this incredible, incredible. I don't know where it's exactly where it's based, but I, I heard it in the name of Rabbi Soloveitchik, and I'm going to share with you a tshuva of Rav David Zvihafen. Rav David Zvihafen was one of the great, great rabbanim in the 19th century. Really, with a great, he was the head of the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary, one of the great leaders of modern orthodoxy in the 19th and the 20th century. And he says something unbelievable. He says that, just, just for the sake of time, he gives the analysis, and then he says the very last line of, of the next source, of source number 13, he says, 
Tani Yigmor Kola Parsha, when it says we have to finish the parsha, it includes that last pasuk. The chol zeb is non shebeis hamikdash kaya. This is all. This is how. This is how they would have a haggadah when the beis hamikdash was around. They actually read that pasuk. It was built into the haggadah at that time. And maybe even in Babel they didn't say it. Says with David Yafin, yes, we should be reading it. But when we stop short and we don't say that pasuk that God brought us to the land and gave us the base of and gave us Eretz Yisrael, we should pause and basically say, yeah, that's because we're still in a state of Hormon. So built into the structure of the Haggadah itself is the idea that, we, that we're mourning the base of We eat the eggs, mourner's food. It's the same night as Tisha B'Av, mourning. The structure of the Haggadah itself is mourning. It's an unbelievable thing. So on the one hand, we have two competing themes. On the one hand, we have the celebration, the commemoration of what was. On the other hand, we have the mourning, the lamenting of what isn't. And in some strange way, they integrate. They almost feed off of each other. It's almost as though we're saying, we want to sit like the base of Mikdash. That's why we do the kittel and we have the karpas that we would never wash for during the rest of the week. And every single one of our piyutim ends, dayenu and al-chas kamavakam and the levikah. We're always talking about the Beis HaMikdash. Yes, yes, yes. And then we sort of realize, wait, but no, no, no. No, no, no. It's an unbelievable, it's an unbelievable dialectic. We bounce back and forth. The more we try to reenact, the more that we're mourning. The more we want, the more we're lacking. It's an incredible thing. And that becomes one of the most primary themes. I actually saw, I was talking to uh, Barry Eisenberg. I was walking with him to Shul. He's out of the country now. He told me he wasn't going to be able to share. I told him what the share was about. He told me, uh, which actually I didn't say, I have a chance to look at it inside. He said that there are some people, it's actually, it's, it's incredible how you see this tension in so many areas of the Haggadah. When we say Halach Ma'anya, the song we open the, the Magid with, basically. So we say, Kol Dichvin Yesei V'Yifsach. Anybody who can, who's hungry can come and, and they can come and have part of our Pesach with us. So he quoted a, now that sounds very much like the Korban Pesach. That sounds very much like we're commemorating. He quoted one of the Rishon, the Shibodeh Haleket, who said that, no, you're not allowed to include that because there's no Beis HaMikdash. So even that, do you say it? Do you not say it? There's a tension, wanting the Mikdash. And what you end up with something incredible. You end up with this incredible equation. Commemoration plus mourning equals yearning. That is what we want. We are theme in so many areas of the Seder. You'll see it replete in other places as well. Is to rebuild the base of Mikdash. We conclude the entire Seder basically with what? Lashana haba Yerushalayim habnuya. It's that simple. We begin with it and we end with it. But let me ask you a basic question. We're not going to go more than an hour, by the way, in case anybody's looking at their watches. I am. I'm looking at the watches for you. Don't worry. We'll be done with the entire thing. No later than eight forty. Then. 9.45, maybe even earlier, so don't worry. Um, why? Why is the Beis HaMikdash? What, is that what the Seder night's about? If I asked you, if I woke you up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I said, hey, 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 Shabbat, can I ask you a question? What's Seder night about? What's Pesach about? What would you say? Pick one thing, one thing that the Pesach's about. No? You want to pay, pass, pass to Amuna. <laughs> Amuna, one thing. Get out of Betrayim, right? Yitzhiyas Betrayim. That's what, what Shava was going to say, right? So, you see, Yitzhiyas Betrayim. What does it do with Beis HaMikdash? Let's just focus on Yitzhiyas Betrayim. Maybe you want to go to Yamsuf. So, so the, the answer to this basic question, it, it highlights for us what the goal of the Seder night really is ultimately, what the goal of Yitzhiyas Betrayim is. And I hope that Mir Tashem to tie it in uniquely to my, to my father, Zerchan Lavracha. Rav Tversky, in order to explain this question, he gave one very simple answer. It's a Pasuk. The Pasuk in Malachim, in source number 14, tells us something very interesting. When Shlomo HaMelech was building the Beis HaMikdash, and the Beis HaMikdash was completed, there's a very interesting phrase that the Navi tells us. Bayhi bishmonim shana va'arba me'os shana l'tis b'nei Yisrael me'eretz mitzrayim. The building of the base of Mikdash was dated 480 years from Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Now, who knows, how do, how do we usually date things in Tanakh? There's a very simple way. 
and if it's in Tanakh and it's in, included all the way into the Mishnayos and the Gemara, it's very complex. How do we, how do we date? What was that? The kings, yeah, it's it's the year the year of the reign of a king. It could be a Jewish king, it could be a non-Jewish king. We just read Megillah Esther. It's, it's replete with the dating in terms of this, the, the the rule of Achashverosh. So we have that here also, right? Because it's going to tell us the next part of the pasuk. We do date it that way. Right? We do date it that way. But yet the pasuk has a, a clause. It's unnecessary, and it dates Yitzias Matrai in four hundred and eighty years. To the building, to, to the building of the, of the base of Mitzvah, should be four hundred years for the Yitzias Mitzrayim. That's not necessary, but it is necessary. And the reason why it's necessary is because yes, Yitzias Mitzrayim, sure, it happened four hundred eighty years prior, but it's not simply a calendaric note that the Navi is giving us, but rather this was the culmination of a four hundred eighty year process. The the Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, the exodus that began 480 years prior, was only completed when we finally built a Beis HaMikdash on Har Habayis. That was one long Yitzhiya Mitzrayim. It's not just simply a quirk. And the truth is, if you look at the Pesukim, you can work your way back, and you'll see something incredible. And Az Yashir, we say it every day. We say, Zek Kelev Vehu. This is God, and really, what it really means, I'm going to beautify it, but it also is from the word Naveh. Naveh is a synonym for the Makam HaMikdash. Unculus, in his Aramaic, tells us, what does Ze'e Levi on Vehu mean? We're going to glorify God. He says, Ve'ivni le'i mikdasha eloha. I am going to build a Beis HaMikdash. When we're singing the song on the sea, we're already thinking, 480 years later, we're going to build a Beis HaMikdash. And then it's explicit in the Pesukim Nazi Ashir. Ke'vi'eim ha'vashit'eim v'harna chalasacha, ma'chom l'shit'cha pa'alta Hashem, pasuk yitzayin, mikdash Hashem, konunu yadecha. An incredible thing. They're already planting the seeds for the building of the Mikdash when we're leaving the Mitzrayim. That's our ultimate end goal. But it's more than that. It's verse 17, 18, 19, for the sake of time, we're just going to say it outside. When Moshe Rabbeinu was not sure whether he was the right man for the job, he says, Hashem, how are they going to know? He says, I'm going to tell you how they're going to know. They're going to know that you're the right man for the job when they take you out of Egypt and we're going to take you to Har Sinai. And the Pesach says, you're going to be you're going to worship God at Har Sinai. The Ramban, the theme that runs through Nachmanides' parish and the entire, uh, the entire uh, Shemos uniquely, is that there are stages. God revealed himself. That was the next stage of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, Har Sinai. The Mishkan, the purpose of the Mishkan, according to the, Ram, according to the Ramban, was to perpetuate the revelation of God, but in a more hidden way. That which we experienced at Har Sinai in the broadest way was perpetuated in the Mishkan in a smaller way. And the Mikdash is just a natural extension of that. It's an incredible thing. That were simply it was simply one long exodus. It wasn't enough just to be freed from. It wasn't that we were leaving from, but it was also that we were moving to. We were arriving at. We were brought to that final destination. And that destination was the Mikdash. Mir Tashem will be the Mikdash. The Rambam, he says this in a very powerful way. In source number 20, and we'll this, conclude, this will conclude this particular section. When we conclude the Haggadah, the story of the Haggadah, the Rambam writes, source number 20, underlined section, HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought us close to Him. He separated us from the other nations. And He, he brought us close to His oneness, to that revelation, to understanding God. We left Egypt not just to leave them, but to come close to God, which takes a manifest in the Beis HaMikdash in its most pure fashion, the Hirashi Yibana Beis HaMikdash, on Harabayis, in Yerushalayim. And because of that, that really is what our Seder is all about. Our Seder is about a Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim that didn't end at the Exodus. It began at the Exodus. It was completed its first stage 480 years later, says the Navi, at the building of the Beis HaMikdash. But because we don't have it nowadays, we have a tension. There's a perpetual tension in the Seder. On the one hand, we're trying to commemorate what was. We're also, unfortunately, struck in many ways by what isn't. And that leads us to a yearning of a tefillah for what will be. And that should be the end goal. And so when we finish the Seder, we say, 
That's simply the culmination of this dialectic. That's the crescendo. That's the ideal that we're striving for, to have a sense of yearning, to say, I wish the Bisa Mikdash were rebuilt. But more than that, I wish that I felt a certain closeness to God that perhaps I'm lacking. Kirvanu li like the Rambam writes. I want to be able to see God in this world. I want to be able to relate to God directly in this world in ways uniquely perhaps in the past six months that we haven't been able to. When I, when I started saying Kaddish, I started to meditate on all different parts of Kaddish, but really Kaddish in its purest sense, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into such detail tonight, but Kaddish really has like three parts. The first part, which is the Chatzik Kaddish, that we say when we divide parts of davening, it's the beginning of all the other Kaddishim that we say, is really simply about God being great. In fact, the Gemara says in source number, in source number 21, at the very end, it says that this was that the reason why the world exists, Bishashi Yisro Nechnasan Labate Knesios Labate Mitroshos Faun and Yeshme Hagadol Mavorach Kadish Baruchu Mena Nea Roshov Omer Ashrei Hamelach Shemakal Sinos of Aveso Praiseworthy is the king who is praised in this way in his home. Malo Laav Shehigla as Banav. How painful it is for the father who has kicked his children away from the table, no longer a base of Mikdash. But Oilahem Labanim Shagalu Me Al Shulchan Avihem. Because that's, that's the ultimate praise. The ultimate praise is to realize the greatness, the greatness of God. My father, Zechon Levracha, he lived a life that was defined by the greatness of God. This goal that we're trying to achieve on Seder night, Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, leading toward the building of the Beis HaMikdash, trying to see God's presence in this world, that's our avoda. So my father lived lived a life like that. It's, 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 it's hard, the more that I've, I reflect on it, I, I don't think I reflected on it enough when he was alive. So he, he grew up in a non-religious home, completely non-religious. I would even say maybe a little bit anti-religious in a certain way, justifiably. And he went to Hebrew school, and he started to become religious, watch this, when he was six or seven years old. He kashered his parents' kitchen when he was 12. Just uh, hard to fully, <laughs> hard to fully grasp. I, I was not kashering kitchens when I was twelve. You know, as I can tell you that. But he had he had a connection. He understood. He osa ms nishu ms. He understood what it was, and he continued to grow in that way. He was attracted to to frumkeit, and in, with, without any shtick. But he was he was particularly particularly driven by the fact that God runs the world, and this was the way that God ran the world. He was a very high-level scientist. He has a, has a master's degree in particle physics, and then he left that to become a very high-level physician. And he told me all the time, I, I still remember so many times, he would say what the kavana that he would have when he would say, Asher Yatsar, to see the beauty, the, the neflo sabore, to understand what it was like for God to create the world like this. And he, I remember an example he gave me once. He was talking about a dialysis machine. If one of the persons having kidney failures, they have to go on dialysis. They have this huge machine, very painful. And he would say to me, like, this is with all of our technology. We've come up with this big machine that a person has to attach themselves up to, Rahman al-Islam, three times a week, whatever it is. And the, the, the kidney, which is like not even the size of a fist, the Ravonish will create this little tiny thing that just can help us to function. It's Marabu it's, it's, Hashem. But I'll tell you even further. With, with, uh, I didn't ask Hananya permission, but my, my son Hananya had a little, little bit of holy chutzpah when my father was very sick. And he, my father was very sick. He was in the hospital. And we actually have a recording of this. Hananya wanted to ask questions that I feel like maybe only a teenager can ask. I, I was not able to ask such a question. But he, uh, the holy chutzpah of uh, the oldest grandchild. He asked permission for us. Okay, yes. Okay, fine. This, this, with permission or not, you know, Zadie wasn't going to say no, Mom. I, I hear that. I hear. He asked him this crazy question. This, this is a, I have, we have the audio of this. He asked my father the following question. My father was in hospice. He was about to pass away. He asked my father if he was angry at God. I'm going to give you an exact quote. I actually put it on the top of the safer here that I have. And my father's exact words, was just, I just took out some, some other sentences, but really his exact words were, God controls the universe. Why should a living comp person complain? There's nothing else to say. 
Now, I will be I'm forever thankful to my son for having that recording. But that's Yeheshmei Rabba Mavarach That's that's just that's just the reality of understanding that God is great, and He lived His life according according to that mandate, and that's the mandate that the Seder leads us to. There's an awareness, there's a God awareness that says, I am, and he wasn't, he didn't wear this on his sleeve. If you met him on the street, you wouldn't know that he was like, but when you, but when you talk to him, and like we said, we have the audio, it really animated, it animated and, and, and drove his entire life. And so when I would say Kaddish, I would consistently think about this mandate, the Kirvanu Yehudo, that the Ramam says is the pinnacle of the Seder, Yeheshmi Rabba Mavorach, that we say, I would say it 3,000 times. I said over and over and over again. But the Kaddish goes a little deeper. So it's a Kaddish, it's called a Kaddish de Rabbanon. Kaddish de Rabbanon, we usually say after we have, we'll say it tonight after the Shir, nearly the Agadata, different, different uh, parts of the parts of Torah that we learn. And essentially, if you look here, I structured out for you what the what the Kaddish looks like. And it's a it's an incredible thing that the Kaddish de Rabbanon, after we have the first portion, you see where I, where I put the arrow, the second portion tells us that it's a prayer for Torah scholars and students. And my father never learned a day in yeshiva in his life. He was not blessed to ever learn in yeshiva. Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it because he's been through Shas more times than me. So I think he's been through Shas, I think, three times, maybe four times. He had a chavrusa. This is, this is an incredible statistic. One of his neighbors, he had a chavrusa for almost 40 years, every single Shabbos. 40 years. The same fellow who was a very special person. And they learned all, almost all of, I think, all of Mishnah Bura, every Shabbos. They just made their one sif at a time. And then he had another chavrusa. He went to another Rosh Hashiva. But, but, but Torah was his way of connecting. That was, that was his way. You want to know what's on Hashem? You want to know what, what it means to be connected to God? To know God? You have to learn Torah? He was, he was with a Gemara. My, my, my father retired. So he, my father retired. So he was, he was working. He was, my father was a cardiologist. And when he retired, he kept one job. He worked at a nursing home. And it was a very good job, the nursing home. You know, it paid well. It was not very demanding. He called it the nursing home colo. Because he was able to sit at the nursing station and nobody bothered him, meaning he was on call. It was like a retainer built in. He would sit there, no joke, he would sit there with his Gemara. And he would sit and learn. That was his job. You're on call, Dr. Manjo. He would sit there in the nursing room colo and he would just sit and learn. He would sit and learn shas. And he sat there in between, in between patients. And when he was called, he would go and then come back to the nursing station. But, he, but his job was to be there for four to six hours a day or whatever it was. And until they said, you know, enough. <laughs> you know, that was it. So, so that was his, but the Torah, Torah was his, he has, you know, he has such nachos that I, I had smicha. It was very painful for him because I, I, I had my smicha was hanging on the wall in his office in the house for a very good many years. But when I finally felt, you know, that I probably should hang it in my own office. So I, I begrudgingly, he let me take my smicha. But there's one other thing which I think is very powerful, which is that in the words of Kaddish, in the words of Kaddish to Rabbanon, most of the Kaddish that I said over the course of the year, and as I'm saying this Kaddish, I'm thinking of my father, there's one word that we add when we're in Eretz Yisrael. Almost all the Kaddish that I said were in Eretz Yisrael. Very rarely, I had, I had to, for, for, the, for the Shiva a little bit afterwards, and then for one short, short trip, I was outside of Eretz Yisrael. I didn't want to leave Eretz Yisrael during the entire uh, 11 and 12 months. But we add one word in the Kaddish to Rabbanam. We say as follows, if you look, if you look in, the, in the section, the middle section, there are prayer for Torah scholars. So we say, Al Yisrael va'ar Rabbanam, val tamideyon, val kol tamideyon, val tamideyon, val kol mando askim b'araisa, dibi asra, all the people who are learning Torah, dibi asra in the place, Kaddisha hadein. In Israel, we add the word Kaddisha. We, we, we accentuate the holiness of Eretz Yisrael. And it was so special to me because that put three things on the centrality of Kaddish. And they're all reflected in the Seder. We start with, we're gonna, we, we start with the goal to know God through Yitzhiya Smitraim, ultimately and ending that way as well. We get the Torah, we learn Torah, but the ultimate goal of that is, our, is, 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 is in the Asra Kaddisha, is in Eretz Yisrael. And so I had the Zulchus of saying thousands of Kaddishim. And every time I would think about the Kaddish, I would conjure up these images of my father. And now, what I did with all the Shiurim, and with this last section we'll conclude in Mir Hashem, I was able over the course, and I really thank the Shul here, I, I gave around 60 or so Shiurim here in the Shul, we put it together in a Sefer, and I called the Sefer that I have called Kulchiras David. My father's name was David Nasanata. And I called the Sefer Shiras David. And the reason why I called it Shiras David was because my father liked to sing. 
but he didn't sing the way that other people kind of sing. He had certain ways of singing, and I, I read about it a little bit in the book. My mother would force him to sing. That was painful for all of us to watch, but because of Shalom Bias, my father would, would, would acquiesce, especially Rosh Kodesh. Yalav Yavo, that was like a classic. Yeah, Rosh Kodesh tonight. But he had three songs that he sang to my children, to me, and to my children, and to my, my siblings' children, and he sang them over and 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 over again. So my kids are enamored by it, as is often the case, because they're the grandchildren. But as a son, I was mortified by it. I'd be like, Dad, you got to stop. Ad Kedekah, that at Hananya's bar mitzvah, he davened Musaf for the Amud. And he used three tunes for songs. Alex, I'm going to test you on these. I don't know. One of them, you for sure know. Two, maybe. I'm going to sing with you in a moment. But it occurred to me when my father was very sick in the hospital that these three songs that he sang, they paralleled these three stages. Knowing God, learning Torah, and the centrality of Eretz Yisrael. And I showed it to you in source number, source number 25. One of the songs he sang, I'm going to sing them for you. Buckle in. We actually have a, we, have, we actually, during COVID, we, uh, I made a, a Jeopardy, like, you know, the Jeopardy game for my children. So we had a category called Zadie's Songs. And what we did was we had, I had my father record for, for, for all of us like three or four bars of the beginning of the song without any words. And we have a video. It's actually hilarious. Like Zadie for 200, Zadie for 400, Zadie for 600. And, and, and it's hilarious because nobody else would know the song. Here's the first song, okay? Now, I, I actually tried to find who sings the song. I cannot find it. And it goes like this. Romamu Hashem, Romamu, Romamu Hashem, Romamu. It's a generational thing. Where, are you, where, from where, from where? I looked at Rabbi Sons. I couldn't find it. That's why. That's the first thing I said. I said Rabbi Sons, and I, it's from the not greatest hits because I found the greatest hits. That I actually I looked at Rabbi Sons. That is, so it's, 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 it's generation. So we're talking what the seventies, right? Right. So 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 and so, but but the, but the words, but the word, and he would sing over and over again. It's very deep baritone voice. But what is what do the words mean? I want to elevate God. It's all about God. Then there's a second song he would sing. Torah Siva Lanu Moshe. Now the words we know Torah Siva, but he has a specific tune. He would sing Torah Siva Lanu Moshe. It would go like this in his deep voice. And again, but again, and, and I, it struck me that he sang this song, and like like all the kids, all the grandchildren, we all are like it's like ingrained in us. But the idea of Torah, Torah, Torah was the, the centrality of Torah. So once you once you've set for yourself that God is your pole star, how do you get to that? It was the learning Torah. He didn't waste any time. My brother-in-law told a story when my father was very sick that even after he got crazy diagnoses, he would come home at, at night, and, and we were, were all exhausted, and we're like, holy cow, and we're, you know, we have, we're all just so worried, and but rightfully so. He would sit, he would open, I think, I think if I recall correctly, my, my brother told me it was Mstephas Yuvamos. So those of you who are learning, it's like one of the hardest Mstephas in all of Shas. But that was what he did. The night was over, the day was over, he opened up his Yuvamos, and he sat and he learned. That was it. It's like, story, it's, it's like art school stories. It's an incredible thing, but it's true. They were there, they, they saw it. But then there, was, then there was a third song that he sang. The third song that my father would sing, which is more of a folk song, I think. I think it won an award in like 1970 in one of these uh, festivals in Tel Aviv. So this you might be more familiar with. Sisu es Yerushalayim giluba, giluba, kolo. You're going to get in the circle. My mother's going to the dancing and the, the hands and the, you know. And then, And we sing these songs. Oh, good, Baruch Hashem. Yeah, there we go. But, but it struck me that was the final stage. That was the final stage. That was the progression. That Sisu Yerushalayim, my father was blessed uh, over the last years of his life. He made, formerly made Aliyah. He was actually, and this is not such a great accomplishment in, given the, at, at the time, the current political reality. But he was actually able to vote in an election. You know, he could have been here any week and voted in an election. But he was able to, he was able to actually make Aliyah and then, and then vote in an election. And he was extremely proud that we were here. He was extremely proud that, we're the, that our branch of the family uh, had made Aliyah. And the truth is, the truth is that that was what my father represented. That was a song of his life, of seeing God, learning Torah, and eventually getting to Eretz Yisrael. So much so, I noted in one of the essays that I wrote, was that he, used to, he changed his, his letterhead. 
as, as he, my parents had an apartment on Derek Havron for many years, and it was no longer the New Jersey address, but the letterhead would say his name, and it would say their address in New Jersey, and their address in Derek Havron Yerushalayim. Because his whole identity had been transformed. His whole identity was completely changed. And that was his life. And so that's a legacy that we have. And that's the legacy that we seek to perpetuate at the Seder night. We have Yutiyas Mitzrayim, a God awareness, a guard awareness that then goes to the uh, Avoda on Har Sinai, but it doesn't end there. It ends in the base of Mikdash, 480 years later, where we're supposed to come closer to Kaddish Baruch Hu. The Malbim, on that Pasuk, the Rabbi's son song, which I, Jay, you're going to find for me, is in source number 28, the Malbim says, Romamu, as Dome Hashem Keshochin Binehem. If we elevate God, then it's going to be He's like living amongst us. It's almost as though God is dwelling on, on the mountain down low. We should raise up Hashem and then we should worship Him on His mountain. Because that's where God dwells. The Kadosh. Hashem Elokeinu B'Sochenu, and God's sanctity is amongst us. Ve'alzeh lo amar kadosh hu, it doesn't say that God is holy, ki hu Eloheinu v'nimtza b'neinu. It is not enough to leave God separate from us, but God has been elevated, we've been elevated, we worship God, He's our God, and because of that, He is amongst us. And perhaps that is the goal of the Seder night. That, I think, is something that we learned from my father's life, particularly upon reflection over the past past uh, now 13 months, and through all the 3,000 or so Kadeshim that I was blessed and privileged to say over the past of the year, passing of the year. which we blessed, I found a unique version of how we conclude the Seder. Chasal, this is, this, is from, this, is from the, this is the way they used to sing the end point, the one slight difference in the Nusach, in the 1400s in Ostreich. This is from a Talmud called Leket Yosher, the Talmud of the Trumas Hadeshin. And he writes as follows, this is the, this is the Nusach that would say at the end of the Haggadah. We've completed the the, 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 the the Seder of Pesach with all of its halachos. Just like we've been hopefully succeeded to try to give some order, some sense. We should also be blessed to actually do it, not just in the Seder, but in the Beis HaMikdash. But now look at the final, the final uh, stanza and how it relates, I think, so powerfully to what's going on today in current events. Zach Shochin Me'ona, the pure one who dwells on high, Komim Kahal Mimana, make upright the uncountable, the uncountable congregation. Maher Litzion Nitechana. We should go quickly, those saplings should go quickly to Tzion, Ufiduyim Litzion Berina. We can read that word in so many ways. Ufiduyim, those who are redeemed, should be blessed to go to Tzion, Berina, should be able to worship on the Harabayas with the Beis HaMikdash and to be able to fully, fully experience the reality of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, in our lives. Thank you for joining me. And then Shama should have an album. Yes, <laughs> 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 <
Okay, we're gonna dive in uh, anyone who wanna double dive in my we'll dive it over here. Please take sushi home with you before take food home with you. Oh, yes. Your father left you somebody the spot. Oh, well, that's your morning perspective. In fact, I think we don't we don't need better horse radish either. It's 